tell you what, there's nothing like hearing all the to set up a, a you know, sense of disappointment thereafter, right? Sorry about that. Um, so tonight, unsurprisingly, I'm going to be talking to you about the Tudors. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you about why I think that they are so fundamental to developing our national psyche, um, our sort of collective sense of national identity. And you might think, why is this? Is it perhaps because it's something that we all learnt at that very vulnerable age at school where you're thinking about wanting to become a princess or uh, perhaps a knight? This is, um, the, this is uh, something, a picture that was just sent to me on Twitter the other day by someone being you know, inculcated into the faith early on. Perhaps the same happened for you. Or is it because, frankly, you can't make it up? You've got a tabloid story of the much-married Henry VIII who killed two of his wives through to the unmarried virgin queen. I mean, it, you know, it, actually, fiction doesn't get this good, does it? They have to keep borrowing it from the Tudors, as we keep noticing. Or is it just because it has contemporary resonance? <laughs> I would argue that actually it's because... <laughs> Um, it's because the Tudors had impact. This is, they're not just people who were developing a sense of national identity. They are the founders of our sense of national identity, the creators of it. And they did so in a number of different ways because they helped form those things that have made Britain, Britain. Now, this is astonishing when you think about it. There are only five or six of them, if you count Lady Jane Grey. It's only 118 years compared to the 351 of the Plantagenets. And yet, in the time that the Tudors were on the throne, I think they did more to shape our national identity than anything that had gone before. I think that their impact was greater. And they, I would actually go so far as to say that they were the most important and significant dynasty in our history. Um, and it's because what they did is to found modern Britain in many ways. So I'm going to look at some of those ways with you. But in terms of thinking about what makes Britain Britain, we have to turn to the idea of being Protestant, the Church of England. We need to look to the founding of the modern state. We need to think about them being the founders of the navy and of empire. And we need to think, of course, about Shakespeare, about the English Renaissance. I mean, so much have the Tudors thought to st stand for Britain that when work started at Sangat on the Channel Tunnel in 1989, they had two uh, huge cardboard figures, one to represent France and one to represent England. And the one chosen for France was Francis I, and the one for England, of course, Henry VIII. I mean, we can all see it, can't we? You can picture it in your mind's eye. And one of my favourite quotes about Henry VIII comes from 1870, a chap called Edward Freeman that said that he, he thought Henry was a tyrant and a vandal, but for all his crimes, he was at least an Englishman. You know? <laughs> so there's this very much this sense that they are at the root of Britishness, Englishness and then Britishness. So what's my evidence for this? What claims am I making here? Well, the first point is, of course, the creation of the Church of England. And that this was, you know, I, I can see that you might doubt this. You might say, OK, are you saying our national identity springs from Henry VIII's loins? Well, as a historian, of course, I'd say, oh, it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, and I'd say, you know, it might be because he fell in love. It's also very much because he needed a male heir. And actually, it might be something else. J.J. Scarisbrick was a historian who suggested that actually, if there had been no divorce crisis, Henry might yet have taken issue with the Pope because Henry became really attached to the royal supremacy, really attached to this idea that he was first under God and that therefore it should be he who presided over the church in England. Even before the 1530s, the crisis moments, Back in 1515 at Baynard's Castle, he had said, by the ordinance and sufferance of God, we are king of England. And kings of England in times past have had no uh, or superior but God alone. And so what we see happen under Henry is a series of acts 
that bring that into being. L look at this picture that just kind of sums it up. This is from the Great Bible. And I think this gives us a taste of how Henry saw himself. The, you see Henry there, he's munificently handing out the word of God to his people. And above him is what can only be described as a rather squashed God. <laughs> but Henry and that direct connection with the divine are the crucial things going on here. That actually there's no intermediary. Henry and God are on you know, speaking terms. That conduit to the divine, the hotline, he has it. And so he carried out this series of acts to push through the break with Rome. In August 1530, we see the first suggestion of what this will look like when it's ordained that no Englishman could be summoned out of his homeland to go to a foreign jurisdiction, i.e., in this case, to a divorce court in Rome. And by 1534, this has become the full doctrine of supremacy. It's declared that Henry was supreme head of the Church of England. In fact, they say, and he always has been. It's just sort of they haven't noticed it recently. And behind this is an idea that England is an empire. Now, this is an interesting idea because um, it, it contains within it the seed of belief that England itself um, cannot bow to any other authority, any other jurisdiction. In the, the preamble to the Act of Appeals of 1533, it says, whereas by diverse, sundry, old, authentic histories and chronicles, it is manifestly declared and expressed that this realm of England is an empire. It, it carries this idea that no other ruler should have authority over England. In other words, what I'm saying is that the creation of this doctrine of the royal supremacy massively enhanced the standing of the English monarchy at a time when England was a pretty puny country on the outskirts of Europe. By comparison to the great powers of the Holy Roman Empire or France, England was, you know, pretty much nothing, a little squat thing of very little interest. And yet this declaration of the supremacy bought um, authority and power. And actually, I would say that much of our sense of national identity rests on this idea. Um, it's the idea that has underpinned much of what's happened since. And of course, the idea that by the end of the 16th century, although Henry would have been shocked, that by the end of the 16th century that this had become a Protestant country has been utterly fundamental to our history. It's the reason why um, we had a civil war, or what, actually definitions of what it meant to be Protestant. It's the reason we had the Glorious Revolution in 1688 and the Bill of Rights that followed in 1689. It's the reason for the 1701 Act of Settlement that said that no monarch could be a Catholic. In fact, today, monarchs can only marry Catholics. I, I mean, I'm not suggesting she's a secret Catholic, as far as I'm aware, she's not. But even today, a monarch can only marry a Catholic, not be a Catholic. So the only, they, they, they can be any other religion, incidentally, but under law, they can't be a Catholic because, of course, the Queen is the supreme governor of the Church of England, a title adopted by Elizabeth I and carried on to this day. And in fact, there's a lot of support for this. A recent survey said that 79% of people approve that the, of the Queen being Supreme Governor in this survey. That actually, there's someone over here who disagrees violently, but 79% of people, madam, would, would disagree with you. Isn't that interesting? I mean, it seems quite extraordinary. And of course, it comes very much from the Tudor period. This is a, di a direct inheritance from that period. And I'd say that actually... There's something else about our identity that comes from that as well. Because our identity wasn't just defined by what we would not be, i.e. Catholic, but by some other more nebulous qualities. So uh, these are what the, um, uh, the writer Max Weber called the Protestant work ethic. You know, these ideas of individualism and industriousness and diligence and duty and capitalism I, you know, ideals that we like to think of as defining tenets of Britishness. Of course, these all spring, we're told, from this idea of Protestantism and, of course, were ones that we uh, exported elsewhere as well. 
And it's because of the Tudor period that the title of Fide Defensor, Defender of the Faith, is still attached to the crown. Never mind the fact that Henry was given it for writing a book in defense of the Pope, he rather liked it and so had it attached to his title in perpetuity, which is why if you take a 20 piece out of your purse, you'll find FD, Fide Defensor, written on it there for all to see. And of course, there's a very obvious way, we're all, we're all very aware of this, that this idea of England and later Britain being a Protestant nation somehow politically, spiritually distinct from continental Europe is affecting us today. I mean, this suggestion that we were cut off, isolated from Britain has, of course, manifested itself in Brexit. This sense of being a unique nation that has a, you know, a distinct purpose. One thing that makes it distinct as well is the fact that the Continental Reformation was achieved with vast amounts of bloodshed. This is the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre of 1572. It's extraordinary that in this country, the Reformation was practically bloodless. Um, well, or perhaps maybe a more accurate way of putting it, as Peter Marshall has done, is that the Tudor state remained, uh, retained a, a monopoly on violence. Um, so we, I'm not sure the Catholic priests who were uh, racked in the tower or had their nails pulled out and were manacled would feel that actually it was completely bloodless as a period of time. But the vast majority of the time, the violence that took place was that against things centuries of religious practice, ideas about um, purg purgatory that were manifested in um, shrines and pilgrimages, chantries, masses for the dead. These were not easily abandoned, but in some cases they were powerfully dismantled. And actually the brilliance of the Elizabethan settlement would be that after generations it came up with um, a peculiarly English middle way that in the end everyone was made to accept. No one would have thought in the middle of the 16th century that you would end up with a church with bishops and yet a Lutheran idea of justification by faith. Um, we might think with hindsight, yes of course the British would of course go down this middle path that's neither one thing nor the other. But I would actually argue the other way around, that some of our ideas about the middle way about the compromise settlement, about us being a people who are reasonable or practical in the end, come from the sort of settlement that was made in religion under Elizabeth. And of course, Henry VIII was the first king to authorise um, a, a translation of the Bible in English, um, so that all people could have access to a religious text in the vernacular. The idea being, of course, with the Reformation, that all ordinary people could engage with the spiritual um, without uh, having a vicarious relationship, that they, there's a sense of interiority here about faith, that you didn't need a clerical class to intervene, something that was empowering. And, of course, Cranmer's Book of Common Prayer, being a historian, this is absolutely jammed full of beautiful manuscripts, I'm afraid, this PowerPoint, but Cranmer's Book of Common Prayer is the one that we essentially still use in wedding services, baptisms, funerals today. But there's one other way in which this creation of the Church of England, the Reformation here, impacted our sense of national identity. And that comes from the dissolution of the monasteries. So the dissolution of the monasteries changed the religious, hierarchical, um, architectural, topographical face of Britain. It was a destruction of incalculable cultural vandalism. I mean, it was, it's hard to imagine. If you think about the amount of um, Gothic buildings that were destroyed at this time, the medieval plate that was melted down, irreplaceable medieval libraries that were ransacked and jewellery that was dissipated. It, if you try and think about the scale of the loss um, you know, just, just wander around the country, right? The, the, we can see the scars of it on our landscape still today. I mean, at the time, it was a bit like all the schools and hospitals and welfare centres being shut down, not quite overnight, only over four years. 
you know, but 800 religious houses were dissolved, the monks and nuns within them put out into the streets in, in four short years. It was the greatest redistribution of wealth since the Norman Conquest. And it was also something that created a land market. It's because of the dissolution of the monasteries that lands that had previously been in the hands of the crown and the church were sold off to the aristocracy, to the rising gentry. And it started to define where they lived. The home counties are basically a creation that follows the dissolution of the monasteries. You don't get Downton Abbey if you don't have the dissolution. I mean, the clues in the title, right? So actually, in practice, this has become fundamental also to our sense of who we are. And at the time, the dissolution of the monasteries founded things like the building of Hampton Court Palace and Nonsuch Palace, um, coastal fortifications, that were vital to the defence of England later in the century, 1596. Raleigh down in Pendennis, or, um, stopping a Spanish invasion, later used as coastal batteries during the Second World War. So the fact that Britain has traditionally and still very much legally is a Protestant country comes, of course, only from Henry's break with Rome and then Elizabeth's determination to press for a settlement that everyone would accept. And it's something of our national identity that we have exported. But the second point, the second reason why I think that they are founders of our sense of national identity is because under the Tudors, we saw the creation of the modern state. With the accession of Henry VII and Elizabeth of York, we see the end to the Wars of the Roses, it's a little simplistic, but basically, pretty soon afterwards, the end of the Wars of the Roses, which had been this quarrel between two groups of Plantagenets, as you all know, the Houses of Lancaster and York, over who should rule. And so after nearly 30 years of uh, on-off warfare, we have a period of peace and security. And a period of peace and security means that you can move beyond thinking about security matters and invest in the machinery of government. And so as a result, into the early 16th century, we see the relationship between the crown and people changing. Um, we see this even at a sort of basic administrative level. This is a parish register. This tells us, uh, as you can see, people who were christened. From 1538, it became obligatory to keep records of baptisms, marriages and deaths. If you're go doing your genealogy, you're going to find it difficult to go back beyond this because we don't have this sort of information. This is why we don't know, for example, when Catherine Howard or Anne Boleyn, two of Henry VIII's wives, were born because they were women and no one bothered to write it down, and there wasn't any official register. And you need this sort of thing to have... This is the kind of data that's fundamental to the ordering of civil society. We take it for granted. <laughs> And then, of course, you've got the creation of the civil service. Under the Tudors, we see the creation of the post of principal secretary from Wolsey, Cromwell, all the way to um, uh, Cecil, Lord Burley. And they make it into um, a kind of chief executive minister position, controlling domestic and foreign affairs. And over time, it becomes apparent that they could only discharge their duties if they were supported by a staff of clerks. And these are pretty much the future departments of the Secretary of State. By the 1590s, they've established a huge degree of bureaucracy and administration and professionalism. And also, we see the beginnings of the Secret Service under Sir Francis Walsingham. Now, at this time, he runs a series of agents known as intelligencers. And it's not the bureaucratic system that we see at the beginning of the, the, the 20th century. It's based on patronage. It's a web of relationships that goes from p members of the gentry. We have Christopher Marlowe, the playwright, or through down to the petty underworld of the Elizabethans. Uh, it also includes, however, uh, Dr. John Dee, um, who uh, signed off his letters to Elizabeth I with two zeros and a backwards long division sign, which I think makes him the original 007. <laughs> so if we're looking for origins of identity, we could do worse than think about James Bond. 
But more seriously, this is a period in which we see um, the beginning of the use of Parliament in a way that will be fundamental to creating a sense of what our identity should be. Because prior to this point, um, Parliaments had, of course, been called, but they had been occasional king's court, and they were called, generally speaking, in order to get money. In this period of time, we see a change, and we see a change because of the Reformation Parliament that runs from 1529 to 1536. And because of its long sessions, because of the far-reaching measures it achieves, um, we see a change from Parliament being an occasional king's court to becoming an essential part of the constitution. By the 15, from the, so the changes of the 1530s and there on, we see Parliament being absolutely and irrevocably part of the system of government. And the principle of legislation, the operation of statute become recognised. The whole idea of the three parts of Parliament, House of Commons, House of Lords, the monarch in Parliament, become necessary to its authority. So when w Wales and Chester and Calais are incorporated into the unitary kingdom of England, they are all asked to send elected members of Parliament. In 1565, Sir Thomas Smith could declare Parliament the most high and absolute power in the realm that bindeth all manner of persons. So we see this evolution, as I say, from a king's court into a representative assembly whose, in, whose decisions could bind everyone. And this is a change of major significance in our democracy in terms of making parliament into a supreme and sovereign legislator. Of course, it would develop over the years to come. I'm not saying they did at all in the Tudor period, but in terms of thinking about identity, this is a founding idea. It's only two years after the Tudors that we get Guy Fawkes and his friends, Robert Catesby and co, and their attempt on Parliament. Um, why? Because it's so important by that point to the idea of what it means to be, at that point, English becoming British. We also see, under the Tudors, um, an idea of shaping the country. Because when the Tudors take the throne, what we have really, the British Isles has been, as it was left by you know, Henry VI and Richard III, Edward IV, had been pretty much that held by the Anglo-Saxons with bits of Wales attached, which had been held down over the preceding centuries by violence. Um, what the Tudors managed to do was to formally annex in 1536 and 1543 Wales to establish the 12 counties of Wales, and the border with Wales hasn't shifted since. And this, of course, is a constitutional form of the greatest consequence into in the beginning of creating the idea of Britain. And, of course, under the Tudors, we also have the first colony, which is Ireland. Um, the Tudors, in fact, are the first to conquer the whole of Ireland. I mean, Henry II may have called himself ruler of Ireland, but it's, uh, Henry VIII is the first king to subdue and rule the Irish, sending English Protestants over to plant and colonise to wrest control from the Gaelic populations. And then, of course, this is extended, once he's been declared king of Ireland in the 1530s, extended by Mary um, and then by Elizabeth to the, over the west of Dublin, sending English settlers to plant um, plantations. And, uh, and as a result, we see several major riots. Elizabeth sends her favourites to crush them. Um, Raleigh is not well remembered in Ireland because of the Smerwick massacre under which, over which he presided. But they brought all Ireland under English control by the end of the Nine Years' War. And, of course, this is an act of religious settlement and colonisation. Gaelic Ireland would never be the same. We see the imposition of English law. We see English language and culture being imposed. The disarmament of native lords. Um, lost lands and lost hereditary authority. And, of course, the consequences for that, be they negative, have been with us all through our lifetimes. This is a conflict that was initiated by the Tudors. And therefore, this is an example of the Tudor monarchs having impact, creating this sense of our identity up to this day. 
Also, related to the, back to that idea of supremacy, I'd also say that the Tudor period is an age where England's position in Europe, though distinct from it, is established. The field of cloth of gold that was staged by Thomas Wolsey in 1520 was kind of like England's coming out party. And I know when you see this uh, on TV, you see about three people dancing in a field and it looks all fairly plinky plonky. But what we need to think instead is more like the Beijing Olympics, right? This was a declaration on a massive scale, 12,000 people in a field on English soil in northern France, uh, two and a half weeks. Um, you know, it, this was the Glastonbury of its day, but it's, it's all on a massive scale, and it's a recognition in many ways by, that, that's achieved by Wolsey of England's status. Because crucially, actually, despite that, this is the age of turning away from Europe. The best thing that happened to the Tudors, although at the time it was a blessing very much in disguise, um, was that they lost Calais in 1558. The Plantagenets had been wildly obsessed by hanging on to their old uh, lands in France. And of course, the losses of Gascony and Normandy in the 15th century had led to crisis. But under the Plantagenets, we'd had a court that spoke uh, actually French up until the time of Edward III, that married French queens, uh, Hen Henry II and Eleanor of Aquitaine, or Edward II, Isabella of France. I mean, Richard Lionheart, that most English of kings, well, he's buried in front of Rouen Abbey in France. And actually, it's only when we get to the Tudors that we see, of necessity, I don't think they wanted to, of necessity, this turning away from this pursuit of this massive historical dead end, the bankrupting of England to try and focus on a trans-channel empire. Now, of course, Henry VIII shares some of these retrograde passions. He is the one who harks back through his uh, fruitless, though mercifully short, wars in France. But actually, he wasn't um, up with the times because the future for the Tudors, for England, lay actually outside Europe, not in the old lands in France, but on building an Atlantic empire. The Tudors would have their Calais in the New World. And we see the beginning in this period of time of building up trading relationships around the world. Um, the Tudors had looked forward. This is a way in which England, and later Britain, became a maritime, outward-looking, cosmopolitan nature. It, it, it stopped being perceived from outside as the sort of backwater uh, country ruled by cousins of French dukes and became a country with its own autonomous identity and clout. And this is, of course, because the, this is a period in which we see the beginnings of empire. The Tudors saw the importance of discovery, the age of exploration. This is the Mappa Mundi. This is the world as it, as it was seen in 1300. It was oriented towards Jerusalem. Here is where we get to the British Isles, on the edge of the map. Now, compare and contrast, this is a Tudor map. <coughs> it puts Britain as it now is at the centre. This is a Tudor creation and invention. And it's, not, it's no surprise that whilst previously, the most, by the, even at the beginning of the 16th century, the most important towns had been places like York and Norwich, by the end of the 16th century, the places that were most important were Bristol and Exeter and Newcastle and Plymouth. Why? Because, of course, this is England tearing its gaze away from the continent to focus on the wider world. Empire is something that was pursued by the Tudors, financed by the Tudors. It was a Tudor enterprise. And of course, the story starts with Francis, uh, from, sorry, with John Cabot, an English fleet under, um, an Italian with an English fleet, financed by Henry VII going to Canada in 1497. And it's true that the Tudors do then drop the empire baton for a little while, but they pick it up quite soon later by the time we get to the 1560s, 1570s, and of course, crucially into that story is Francis Drake. Um, in his voyage in 1567, one of his first voyages with John Hawkins, he was attacked 
by the Spanish. And this encounter and the fervent faith of his lay preacher father gave Drake a real sense of destiny. And he is the first man to accomplish a circumnavigation of the globe. Magellan didn't make it home, so he turns out not to count. Uh, but, but Drake, captain, and this voyage. And it meant surviving violent encounters with natives, threats of mutiny, um, relentless storms, attacks from the Spanish. He and his crew sailed through the Strait of Magellan, up the coast of Peru, across the Pacific, and home by, by Cape of Good Hope. And in so doing, he claimed, apart from Ireland, England's first overseas possessions, the Elizabeth Island and Nova Albion in California, not ones they hung on to. But he, it's the beginning of the sense of identity is in these nebulous things. What can you do? What, what sort of nation are you? When he returned, he was knighted on board. Um, the Spanish called him El Draco, the dragon. He was so terrifying. And he brought back with him £600,000, or two, twice the annual revenue of the country. Um, he gave the Queen enough to pay off the national debt we could do with him today. And the idea behind all of this was that it, it was turning the attention of the English crown to these overseas possibilities. And this, of course, needed some justification. And here comes our old friend, John Dee. John Dee, this polymath, was the first to suggest the idea of the British Empire, or spelt empire in this particular period of time. But what he suggested was that early Britons, including perhaps King Arthur, had visited America. And therefore, this gave the English rights to conquest and colonization in the New World, a British Empire. So this is the basis on which it proceeds. So we have Sir Humphrey Gilbert, um, who gets letters patent for six years to search out and settle lands in Newfoundland. Um, and then we have Raleigh, who sends expeditions um, to try and settle in 1585 in Roanoke. And it's not successful, but the first successful founding of a settlement in the New World by the English is Jamestown, of course, in 1607, in Virginia, named, of course, for the Virgin Queen, still, you know, the centre or the seat of the government of the US. And, of course, then there's other exploratory trips, Martin Frobisher searching out the Northwest Passage, Ralph Fitch spending nine years in India, out of which we see the establishment of the East India Company in 1600. This is a Tudor invention. Um, we get Sir Thomas Rowe sent off um, just 12 years after Elizabeth's death to the court of the great mogul, Jahangir, the first English ambassador to India. And the East India Company, of course, will then gradually, with increasing power and strength, um, take over the rule and conquest of India so that by 1857, they hand, after the mutiny, they hand rule directly to the British crown. This has become fundamental to our idea of our national identity, our heritage, and here it is. It starts in 1600. It's a Tudor invention. And of course, the thing that made this possible was the navy. Henry VIII is acknowledged as the principal founder of the English navy. Ships uh, had been built before, you know, kings had had ships, but Henry is the first to establish a fleet of warships. So from the five or seven that he inherits, he leaves a fleet of 57 out of 106 warships that had served during his reign. And he's the first to invest in the administration and bureaucracy that's necessary to organizing the Navy and to installing a permanent staff. And they also invest in shipbuilding, in dockyards, in the defensive fortresses along the south coast. And above all, they invest in a new type of ships. Ships had previously been troop carriers. The idea, of course, with the Armada is that they would, have, um, they would go and pick up troops in the Netherlands and bring them over um, to land and then storm the capital. Um, Robert Hutchinson points out that actually, uh, if they had managed to do that, then there was no way that we could have withstood them because, the, uh, as he puts it, the Elizabethan militia makes Dad's army look, look like a highly honed war machine. But at the time, we didn't have to because of the navy. 
And one of the crucial things that they did was to change ships from being these troop carriers into ocean-going vessels that could circumnavigate the globe and that were manoeuvrable ships with guns on board. Not for boarding others, but for shooting at, at a distance. So the defeat of the Spanish Armada in the end is obviously partly thanks to our British weather, but also because of ship-mounted cannon. This, this might sound dreadfully dull, but I, I assure you that the, the idea of being able to fire from long distances and not be reached was absolutely crucial. This is the most important maritime invention up to the invention of the aircraft carrier. Um, and of course, this meant that um, we have, well, privateers, uh, you know, essentially licensed pirates like Drake, able to use their quick tactical ships to get great advantage. So we have the Tudors making um, the channel into an obstacle. Um, the the, the um, naval historian Andrew Lambert has always said of the channel that it is not an obstacle, it's a bridge, but under the Tudors it does become an obstacle. Because before this time, there had been constant invasions. 1216, 1326, 1338, 1399, 1405, 1460, 1470, 1471, 1485, the Tudors themselves had invaded. And so they knew how very important it was to stop that. They were determined to not let it happen again. The Tudors, um, under, with the Royal Navy under Henry and then under Elizabeth, made uh, the channel in, into an obstacle that could stop an invasion. It was a foundational move in British history. They pretty much secured the seas around Britain, the British Isles, up until the, uh, which lasted up until the Second World War. So it's again this idea that under the Tudors, Britain began, began to become a maritime nation. And with the success of the Armada, this reputation was sealed. It became possible to develop colonies overseas. This was absolutely vital to British history for the next 300 to 400 years, absolutely vital to our sense of identity. And lastly, there's the crucial idea, of course, that it's the Tudors who presided over an English Renaissance. They were patrons of art, the arts. They surrounded themselves. Oh, sorry, I just put this in last night. I've forgotten I put it. I just discovered this postage stamp, which, you know, after, from 1985, which gives you how cheap post was then. It gives you a sense of how much we still have this at the kind of core of our sense of who we are, that the armada, the, the fending off of this enemy was crucial to us. But back to the idea, English Renaissance. The Tudors were patrons of the arts, um, and the greatest example, perhaps, is Hans Holbein. This is the first great age of portraiture. We may think we know what people looked like in the Middle Ages, because, of course, we have portraits like this. But these are portrait types. Almost all of these are painted in the 16th century. And uh, the first portrait in the National Portrait Gallery it dates from 1505. Um, so what we have under the Tudors is the Renaissance really taking hold. Um, we have, just down the road, um, of course, um, a copy of the first uh, four-length monarch, a picture of an English monarch. Um, it's life-size. This hadn't been done before. You had a very clear sense of how you painted a monarch. It was just the top half only, and they certainly wouldn't be looking at the spectator. But it all changes with Holbein. And David Starkey, I think he ought to get an honourable mention after the earlier one, David Starkey says, with Henry VIII, it is, it, this is Henry. This picture is the reason he fascinates us. It's the beginning of his biography and the key to his mind. It's certainly how Henry wanted to be remembered. And Holbein does this masterful act because he creates a, a sense of Henry's body. You see that his body is basically two triangles. You've got the broad shoulders and a sort of the taper kind of to the way. By the way, there's a sort of anatomically impossibly wide. If you, you imagine what's underneath those layers of gown, they can't really actually go out that far. Anyway, and then you've got the splayed feet. Art historians tell me this is a military stance. He looks like he's just got off a horse. And so you've got a triangle at the bottom here as well. So you've got these two triangles that meet to focus the gaze 
on Henry's bulging codpiece, which in the original is differently coloured, which there's a bow above and which his hands framed in case you haven't noticed it yet. This picture is all about virility and fertility, and this is Holbein's genius. Henry VIII um, was said by uh, Anne Boleyn, and this is reported at Anne Boleyn's trial, to be, um, and I quote, not skillful in copulating with a woman and had neither vigour nor potency. And yet, we remember him as this man of great lusts. That's propaganda for you. In the 18th century, in the Tower of London, um, when he had, his armour is still displayed there, um, people would go, women would go, <laughs> and they would stick pins into his codpiece in the hope of becoming pregnant. Um, well, I mean, he got to try everything, I suppose, but... And I would suggest that this has become a default image of masculinity. Who else can you think of that has, you know, billowing gown, hands on hips, differently coloured pants? Yeah. <laughs> and Elizabeth too masters this uh, art of persuasion through portraiture. But it's not just art. They're patrons of other arts as well. I mean, think of architecture. I mean, we're not far from here, from some of the most glorious houses in Cheshire, Tudor houses. And I would suggest that, actually, Tudor architecture still defines our idea of what is a desirable house, whether it's going from a sort of chocolate box thatched cottage or whether we're actually um, thinking of the grand... You know, if we've got higher aspirations, maybe we'll, we'll hope to move into Little Morton Hall. Or perhaps we might even think of uh, getting ourselves one of these uh, prodigy houses. And it's in the Tudor period that we have the first people, um, Robert Smith and William Arnold, who are called architects. And actually, of course, this is why, um, because of this sense that this is sort of fundamental to kind of who we are, that mock Tudor housing is so very popular. It dominates British uh, domestic architecture today. And that one on the bottom right, that's the public library in Shimla. This is an idea that we even took to India with us. And of course, art and architecture in this period are important, but nothing compares to this as the golden age of literature. We've seen that Henry was the first king to authorise the translation of a Bible, based much of it on William Tyndale's translation of the New Testament. And Tyndale has been called the architect of the English language. And it's in the Great Bible, and then later with this will be all imported into the King James Bible, that we see these phrases, so many of them, so familiar to us, these ways that they have shaped our language, so much of it comes from this great idea to put the Bible in English in the 16th century. But it's also, of course, the age of the first sonnet in English. Um, Sir Thomas Wyatt, a poet at Henry VIII's court, writes the first adaptions of Petrarch, the Petrarchan sonnet. Uh, I'm just going to skip on before you finish it, I'm afraid. It's about, possibly about Anne Boleyn. Um, it, possibly he was attracted to her, but look it up, it's wonderful. And Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, his contemporary, is the first to create what we now call, erroneously, the Shakespearean sonnet, um, that differs in its rhyme scheme, and introdu introduced blank verse, unrhymed verse, into English. And of course, they're both paving the way for the great luminaries of the Elizabethan age, Spencer and Marlowe, and of course, the big man himself, Shakespeare. Ben Jonson said of Shakespeare, he was not of an age but for all time. And there's something about him that's so timeless and universal, about his verse that is, you know, it's, and it's so exquisite, um, that, that it's so ingrained in our culture, it's so performed around the world, that it's easy to forget that he was of a time. Uh, he was he, born in the early years of Elizabeth I's reign. He was formed by the social and political and religious worldview of the Tudor period. His art was written to meet the commercial demands of a flourishing theatre company in London in the 1590s and thereafter. His heyday begins under Gloriana. And for all of Chaucer's greatness, nothing compares to Shakespeare's output of 37 38, depending on who you're talking to, plays, the profound ability to inspire, um, to illuminate the human condition, um, the tra times transcending stories, the great characters, the, the inventive turns of phrase. 
when you appear on Desert Island Discs, as I'm sure you all will, you get given a complete uh, works of Shakespeare along with the Bible, so much as he thought to stand for the best of our culture. If, to mimic Bernard Liven, you cannot understand my argument and declare it Greek to me, if you refuse to budge an inch, if you think I'm playing fast and loose but making a virtue of necessity, if you insist on fair play, if you think that's the long and short of it, the game will out and the truth will up, you either, or even if you bid me good riddance, in each case, of course, you'd be quoting Shakespeare. And so Britain's cultural renaissance happened under the Tudors. In short, I would argue that our national identity is founded in this period because they planted the seeds of those things that made Britain Britain. They were the originators of our identity. Exploration and empire, the backbone of the navy, the break with Rome and Protestantism. This idea of reorientating away from Europe and looking to a trans tra transatlantic world and empire. And of course, this cultural renaissance. And, and finally, I think one way that we can judge our idea of our national identity is to look at the stories we tell about ourselves. Whether you can think of, definitely an extra one there, whether you can think of, um, you know, award-winning uh, films like Elizabeth uh, the First, um, non-award-winning films like The Other Blind Girl, um, the, the Tudors, Wolf Hall, again, another case of compare and contrast. The stories that we tell we tell about the Tudors. And that's because somehow, in everything they created, in this beginning of the modern age, they laid the seeds of what made Britain, Britain. They laid the seeds of our national identity and our collective psyche. Thank you. <laughs>